we've been a part of City Light for three years, and can I just say from our family to yours, to you and yours, we love you. It's such a beautiful community of faith uh, and connection orientated around the Word of God. Um, and needless to say that, that today's word that we're going to be covering is love. Um, right at the outset, if you don't know already, I want you to hear this. You, you're fully loved. There's, there's, right, you can't do anything to, more to be loved by God than what you are sitting in your chair right now. I know, I know this from personal experience that we'll sit here um, often week to week and we're carrying the thoughts of the week just gone. I didn't do this right. Uh, probably shouldn't have said that word. Um, probably shouldn't have made that gesture at that person when I was driving. Um, probably shouldn't have had that series or rabbit hole of thought. Um, but you need to know this morning sitting here or that decision that you made, you need to know sitting here right now, you are completely loved in God. That's it. We could go home. Like we, we could be done on that, on that particular point. Pure love from God compels us forward in faith, whereas a lack of love tends to bring doubt and then an environment of fear. But right now, I'm, I'm telling you, and you need to hear it, and we're going to explore this through Scripture in a moment, you're fully loved. Imagine what that would do if we, if we allowed that to sink into our consciousness and our, our heart, that revelation. You know, love has been hijacked by the world today. Um, the prevailing culture that we live in, um, if, you, if you, you know, watch news or scroll socials or just have conversations with people down the street or even go for a walk in your shopping centre and what you're seeing, what you're exposed to, um, you know, love is whatever you want it to be. Uh, love is love, uh, whatever that means. Have you ever heard that saying? Love is love, is love man. Uh, love is a feeling, which is true, but it's more than that. Uh, love is sex, and it's been just quarantined to that space there. And also, love is for sale. It's, it's a commodity for sale. This is what the culture tells us about today. Um, some songs. Now, I'm going to need a bit of interaction for this. So, any singers, any budding musicians in the room? Steve, James Stewart, I reckon you've got a few tunes. No, the beard, the, the beard is shaking. Okay. Can anyone give us this? I want to know what love is. How does it go? By foreigner. Oh, there it is. Okay, a bit, a bit of Whitney. I'll always love you. Who's, who's got it? Hey, down the front, down the winner. Um, there's a few others. Uh, the Beatles, uh, all you need is love. Come on. And uh, what about Elvis? Can't help falling in love. Come on. Come on. Few, f- <laughs> we actually have Elvis here at church this morning. <laughs> oh, you don't have to sing these ones, but love me, love yourself, Bieber. Um, you know, stupid love, Gaga. So, you know, songs... Uh, you know, you just, you, just, you just search, love is everywhere, we sing about it, there's movies about it, it's in the arts, it's in our daily experience. Um, and it seems that everything, if you, if you look at it, um, circles around getting love. It's like, I want to get love, um, because it'll give me something that I desperately need or I want. Um, and it can, it's almost that it can be traded or sold, yeah? Um, and today we're going to explore God's love for us. And what that means and the revelation of that. Before we get into it, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that as we'll see in your scripture today, that you are love. I thank you that we are fully loved because of what you've done for us on the cross. I pray that your revelation would impact the lives of your sons and daughters here this morning and those watching or listening online. We thank you that you are the king of love. We thank you that you are our source of love. And I pray that you would flow through us and impact our lives and the lives of those around us as we hear your message today. I pray that my words would be your words and your revelation would come in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, so a tweet version of today's message is this, for those of you that are tweeters. Love is God, and love is the acts of Jesus. I'll say that again. Love is the acts of Jesus. So to have love, simply find Jesus. That's the tweet version. Okay, the word. Grab out your phones if you have an old school book, um, as in a Bible with you. Um, Head to 1 John, right at the back of the New Testament. So 1 John, uh, one of three letters in Scripture. 1 John 4, verses 7 to 21. I'll just give you a moment. This chunk of scripture, 1 John 4, 7 to 21, verse 7. So, dear friends, let us love one another because, God, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 9, God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent his one and only Son into the world, so that we might live through Him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Verse 11, dear friends, if God loved us in this way, we also must love one another. Just on that note, verse 11, just look at the person next to you. Are they lovable? Some of you are shaking your heads. Uh, it's not that easy, is it, sometimes? Because of our human emotions and our human experience. But we must, listen to the language there, we must love one another. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has sent but he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Saviour. So powerful, the world's Saviour. Not Plimpton, not Adelaide, not just your, your little family, although that's really important to God, the world's Saviour. Just think about that when you think about the crazy things that are going on in the world. Th throughout generations, Jesus is the world's saviour. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Here it is. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. In this, love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, this is such a convicting uh, verse of scripture here. I'll say, I'm going to read it out slowly. If anyone says that I love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. That's heavy. <laughs> Ever held a grudge? <laughs> Ever, ever held back love? Um, we all have. For the person who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. That's a chunky bit of scripture. Do you know, in, in 21 verses uh, there, oh, sorry, in, in all those verses, um, 25 times the word love is mentioned. So obviously that's a, a classical condensed um, focal point of love. Um, but let's take a quick detour into the different words of love. So Old Testament um, in, in the Hebrew, 
Now, any, we've got a couple of scholars in the room. If I get the pronunciation right, just yell out the right pronunciation. Um, but Ahab, oh, yes, yeah, got the thumbs up. Um, a variety of intensely um, and, and close emotional bonds. Um, it, it's, a, it's the Hebrew word for love. Agape is the New Testament Greek version, um, or an element. Uh, it means God loving us like divine, and we reciprocate with God. It includes the, the concept of commitment, sacrifice, and high regard. Uh, secondly, in, in the Greek, um, agapeo. Now, it was, it's wrong, isn't it? Pants. Pronounce it for me. Agapao. There it is. Um, so that's agapao is where we love each other um, unconditionally. So when we come into community with one another, um, we, we, and, and the love is chosen not based on the beloved, but it's unconditional. We just choose to love the person next to us. Phileo, another Greek connection to the word love, friendship, that delightful feeling and personal attachment. And then finally, Philadelphia. That's that love between brothers and sisters. So love is a complex word and you can look at it through different lenses and in different ways. But first and foremost, love is revealed in the gospel. For those of you that are note takers, that's the first point, so you can write that down. Love is revealed in the gospel. But firstly, we see love expressed in the Old Testament in Exodus 34. So just before the second download of the Ten Commandments, Moses has just chipped out the two stone tablets for a second time. Moses hears God say these words in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 34. So the Lord passed in front of him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. So back in the Old Testament, God is love and downloads that love in the form of law. And Jesus then fulfills the law in the New Testament, which we'll see in a moment. So we fast forward to 1 John 4.9. God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent his one and his only son, that we might live through him. What did Jesus actually do? What did Jesus do as the son? He came as fully human, just like you and I. He walked the roads. He was born to an underage mum, seemingly out of wedlock in a stinky manger. Like sometimes we forget this, the practicalities of what Jesus actually went through. He did a carpentry apprenticeship. Any apprentices out there? Ever done an apprenticeship? It's not easy. You've got people telling you what to do. I'm sure Jesus was the perfect apprentice. He did the trade. He read scriptures. He wrestled with the culture of the day. He walked the dusty road that we walk today in our versions of that. He died as fully God on the cross, which really should have been you and I. He was perfect and blameless. We see this in Isaiah 53. He was hated for no reason. I know a lot of you in our church family, and I know that you have that strong justice streak, that, that value of justice. And when there is an injustice, something rises up on the inside and you want to punch someone in the face. Or you want, you want to make it right. Think about Jesus, the creator of the universe. The very word, living word of God was hated for no reason. And he could have just at any point just made a different type of decision <laughs> and it would have been a different outcome. Think about that. But he held that, held that back, that judgment back. And we see that in John 15, 25 and also in Psalms 69, verse 4. He died and he fulfilled the law. And we see that in Romans 8, verses 3 to 4. But more than just dying for us, he rose from the dead. And we see this in John three sixteen. For God so loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. In 1995, think for those of you that were alive, think about your life, uh, what you were doing in 1995 in November, 1995. That dates me, hey. I was 14. That dates me even more. I had really good hair. Like, I had great hair. Like, some of you, you think you've got good hair? 
I actually, I had really good hair. I grew up in church. I, I grew up and I had heard the Word of God preached, um, much like I'm preaching this morning. Um, but I found myself at a Youth Alive conference. Um, for those of you that don't know what Youth Alive is, it's a youth conference for youth. Lots of band, worship music. And I found myself at the Adelaide Entertainment Centre in November of 1995 as a 14-year-old. And I heard the preacher, after this set of songs, came on and, and just preached the gospel. Pretty much out of John 3.16. And for the first time, I experienced the revelation that Jesus actually died for me. Do you remember, do you remember the moment where you've, you've, you had, you've had a revelation that Jesus died for you specifically? Like where you, where you, you realise that your name was written in the palm of his hand. Your name. Not the person next to you, but yours. A personal Lord and Saviour. And it changed my life forever. I'd heard the word of God before that. But for some reason at this point, I was more open to it. And if you're, if you're sitting here today or if you're listening online and you haven't had that, I believe you will. If you open yourself up to it. Because love is revealed in the gospel. When you realise that should have been you, <laughs> being judged like Jesus was, and he actually took your place, it's profound. It has to change you. And then I married a 16-year-old a couple of years later. But that, anyway, that's a different story for another day. <laughs> I know you're curious about that. But sitting in your chair right now, or your couch at home, <laughs> you are 100% loved. This week, just gone, I was in Melbourne for work. I was sitting at, at a pub having a meal with an atheist. And he said, what are you up to? over the next few days, and I said, I'm preaching on love, <laughs> right? And Lockie goes, you what? He had no idea that, um, you know, and so preaching on love, and, and I shared with him how nervous I was uh, around preaching, and, and to, because I hold it in high regard, and, you know, I want, to get it, I want to get it right, and all these reasons why I was sort of anxious and nervous about this moment right now, <laughs> yeah? And... And he said, what are you talking about? Love, blah, blah, blah. We talked about it. And then he said, James, what would you do if you realised you were 100% fully loved by your God? Would that change anything for you? And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> he nailed it. He actually nailed it. Because in the scriptures before, it talks about that pure love casts out fear. What am I worried about? So I'm standing here. I'm just the short, bald guy. I'm, I'm 41, okay, whatever. <laughs> I've never preached before, but you can too. And it's not about preaching, because we all have our versions of the thing that we don't want to do, or the thing that we're struggling to get to, or the thing that's standing in front of us like that Goliath, like David and Goliath. But if you, were, if you knew you were fully loved, would that change it? doesn't matter, you'll fall forward. For those of you that have had the, the blessing of being a parent, you notice when the, when the kids go from crawling to walking, you're there in front of them, like little Augie right here, he's running around, he's already doing sprinting training for the crows. <laughs> but as a father, like one of my joys in, in raising my kids was seeing them and training them to walk. And as a dad, my joy is seeing them fall over. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> they, they, they fall over. Um, but yet I'm actually there and I'm encouraging them to walk. Go, walk. And then they take these little baby steps. Because they know that if, if I'll catch them. And it's exactly the same with the Father's love for, for you and I. But we get hardened. Our hearts get hardened. There's failure. There's stuff that happens in, in the past. There's, there's gaps where maybe something hasn't happened that we wanted it to. But I want to encourage you, you are fully loved this morning. There's nothing you can do. There's no effort. There's no, there's no status. There's no amount of money. There's no condition. Right now, in your chair. Like if, how would you worship God if, you've, if you really, really knew that? And I'm not just talking about expressive, emotional. I'm just talking about deep 
thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I'm loved because you are. So love is revealed through the gospel. This is point number two for those, those of you that are taking points. Ready? Are you ready? Get your pens out. Love is remaining in Jesus. So verse 16 of our central text this morning. And we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And here it is. The one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in him. I'm going to read that again. That's that last bit of verse 16. The one who remains in love remains in God. And God remains in him. So why does God, do you think, highlight the word remain in that text? And we also see it in John 15, which we're going to look at. I believe because it's a choice. We have options to choose from. We don't need to remain in love. You can, we can choose all sorts of things. And life can be hard. Life can be really hard and really confusing. And there's so many questions that we have that we just, I don't know how to figure that one out. There's a mystery box of questions. And there's a, the whole life experience and we relate to those experiences in different ways. There can be car crashes, um, financial stress, relationship dramas, physical issues, death, unfulfilled dreams. Remember when we used to dream? Sometimes we, we stop dreaming because we don't want to lift our expectations to a point. But life can be hard sometimes, right? And we can pull ourselves out of remaining in Jesus. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had coffee with a friend. Um, who I've known him for many years, but I haven't known him intimately. And I said, tell me his story. And I'm going to give you the nutshell version of his story. First wife uh, died of cancer. And he has faith, by the way, this guy. My first wife, he, she, she died of, of cancer. Um, and also, uh, three months ago, uh, my son-in-law, he, he also died of cancer. Um, I, myself, have suffered men mental health issues. Um, and my second marriage ended as a result of, like, torturous mental health issues. Um, I was riding my bike. This is his story, because I like to be fit. Anyone else like to be fit? Yeah, yeah. Some of you can't tell, but anyway. <laughs> Joke, come on. <laughs> but he likes to be fit because for him, that's a way of managing things, right? You know how we, we have things to manage? So he's riding his bike, gets hit by a car um, five years ago and has irreversible, irreversible brain damage as a result and now functioning, can't function five days a week. So difficulties will either cause us to run from God or abide or run to God and for my mate he's run to God and the way he was sharing his trauma and it is trauma and it's real it's heavy stuff you can't you can't let's not wash that under the carpet it's heavy stuff but for those that remain in God God's God remains in them and the way he was he was sharing his story from a place of still feeling the pain, but knowing that there's a purpose in the pain. So that's when life can be difficult, but life can be great. So there's some of you are thinking, wow, that list that you just read out, I've never experienced that level of craziness. You know, promotions at work, uh, a windfall of money, peaceful times, not fighting, the kids are going great, you know, marriage is cooking, Take your shirt off, you've got abs. <laughs> well, your plans have just never happened for me. <laughs> got one ab. <laughs> and there's you, know when you, you know those moments in life where you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm the man. Because things just, things are ticking. Things are like, there's like metronomic. Yeah, this is really nice. This is actually really good. Um, and I know when I look back at times in my life, I've, I have actually felt invincible at times. Like where I know how to pray to God because when I ask for something, it happens. 
Like, and and, and I, this pride, without even me realising it, this pride comes up and, and I'm, I'm, I'm successful and really it's my own strength and I've wandered away from God. So life can be great and we can choose not to remain in God as well, equally. So we need to watch that, don't we? To go, how am I going? The trauma, but also the success or perceived success. So check this out, John 15. So the Gospel of John 15, verses 5 to 10. I am the vine, you are the branches. You, you know this one. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, they throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. So here it is. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will re remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So just run to Jesus and choose to remain in him. So love is revealed in the gospel. Love is remaining in Jesus. And then thirdly, love is commanded by God. It's actually commanded by God. So John 15, 11 to 13. I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. Notice that Jesus' command doesn't say love ourselves. Our world um, is obsessed with the concept of self-love. You know what I'm talking about? Self-love. Uh, uh, and, and what goes with that is this ideas of, you know, oh, you do you. You do you. You be you. Go find yourself. You go find yourself. Look in. Look in and discover yourself. Um, a lot of Disney films are made about this. Self-love. If left unchecked, self-love really quickly becomes selfish and exclusive. And if, if left unchecked. Now, I'm not saying not to love yourself. In fact, we are called to love what God's given us. But self-love if left unchecked, becomes crazy. You ever walk down Rundle Mall? Or um, go for a walk down Marion, Marion Shopping Centre? Um, have you ever been down to uh, Glenelg or Henley Square at sunset? See a little bit of self-love? Yeah? A few selfies? It's hilarious. We had, a, had, a, had the privilege of having a um, holiday in Bali in February. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people trying to find, I don't know what they're trying to find actually, <laughs> but they're looking at themselves. Yeah. The image stuff, the, the self-love, um, the self-help books, and, and I'm all for them, they're all good, but it, again, if left unchecked, it becomes exclu exclusive and selfish. So God doesn't say, <laughs> love yourself. That's not his command. His command is to what? Love one another. Now, what I find hilarious about this is that it's easy with people that are lovable. Um, but do you have any people in your life that are just annoying? Why'd you laugh at that, Rach? <laughs> What's going on there? Come, do you want to come up here and have a chat? <laughs> Oh, you know those that, and, and often, I mean, should we go there? Should we, should we do it? O often it's those closest to you because you see, you have the privilege of intimacy and close connection and you see each other's gaps more than most. And if we focus on the gaps, we're not focusing on loving. Because Jesus didn't go to the cross and say, I'm here to show you how bad you are. He, he went there and he died and rose again to show 
us how loved we are. And, and just a little, little footnote here. So I want to encourage you in your intimate relationships, demonstrate love. It's so easy to find the faults with one another, which can cause friction and tension. Um, but I want to encourage you to find the love there and to give the love there. Husbands, love your wives as? It's that, it's that easy. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Piece of cake. Piece of cake. <laughs> oh, and we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit for that. John 15, 17. This is what I command you, to love one another. Agapow. So love is the acts of love. Um, it's not just a word to say, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a nice word, nice four-letter word. L-O-V-E, love, that word, sacred love. I really want to be backup vocalist next week. <laughs> so firstly, we need to love e- each other. So what is each other? Um, each other as in the body of Christ. So think about how the early church had such a deep love for one another and all you need to do is open the book of Acts and have a look at the crazy level of love that was displayed for the early church. United in mind, sharing what they had, lifting up the downtrodden, you know, practical acts of love. Um, This created a countercultural movement which was really attractive to the community and and people like, what are you doing? This is different, this feels different. You actually, you guys love each other. And they demonstrated the love of Christ in that way. But the thing is, you know, um, we are sheep and sheep bite. Ever been bitten by a brother or sister in the church? Um, where there's a little, little, you've, you've tried to love and then you're like, meh, bat, and, <laughs> and you get bitten. I was invited to be a mentor to someone a few years back. Um, hey, man, brother, I, lo- I love you, I really respect you, and, you know, um, can, you, can you mentor me? And I'm like, okay, cool, you sure? Because mentoring means truth-telling, right? Um, now, truth-telling can be fun, can't it? Because love... Cause think about Jesus, what Jesus did. He didn't just love us and said, you, I love you, you keep doing what you're doing. He said, I, 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 I love you, but you need to bring your sin to the cross. Because there's, there's truth and it's hand in glove. It's, it's truth and love. And so this gentleman that I was mentoring, um, I, I said to him, are you happy for me to give you some feedback? This is like the third mentoring session in. And he said, yeah, I want you to give me some feedback. And then I went, bang, bang, bang. I gave him this feedback. And he didn't cry, but he nearly did. (laughs) He nearly did. And um, two weeks later, I received a seven-page handwritten note letter uh, about how much I have discouraged him and how much hurt he was carrying as a result. Um, And and how he never wants to talk to me again. <laughs> you know? And so, so even, even when we're in this space uh, and we're, we're inviting it, we still react to one another, you know, because we, there's this tension just in relationship. Anyway, we, we, we mended and it was, and it was good, but it was, I just share that story to say that it doesn't always go well. Um, and maybe I told the truth in a harsh way, um, which I have been known to do. So I've learned from that as well. Tim Keller, um, our brother in Christ, obviously passed away yesterday, was it? Yesterday. An absolute general um, in God's kingdom. And we're so grateful for his life. He said this about love and truth, the relationship of the two. So love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and affirms, you know those nice feelings? It supports and affirms us but keeps us in denial about our flaws. Truth without love, so just truth by itself without love, is harshness. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. And so the relationship between love and truth is, it is hand in glove. We must deliver the facts, the flaws, the gaps, the feedback in love and and, and for love. And also, Tim goes on to say, that not everyone is your brother or sister in the faith. So it's not just about loving one another, but everyone is your neighbour. 
and we must love our neighbour. So a neighbour isn't just someone you live next to, it's someone you walk past, it's someone you work with, it's someone you report to at work, it could be a shareholder of the company you work for or someone on the board, it could be an employee, um, the person that cuts you off in traffic, the person that steps in front of you in the line at the cafe, um, the barista who stuffs up your coffee. Uh, anyone, could be strangers, enemies. Um, we need to love the strangers and the enemies and our na- as our neighbours. Jesus steps through um, what I like to term uh, enemy love uh, in, in Luke 6, 20 to 31. And theologian Sam Wells highlights this uh, in two particular areas. You know where Jesus says, uh, do good to those who hate you. So do good to those who hate you. Okay, yeah, that's, that's easy. So by your actions, as Sam goes on to say, so by your actions, however much you hate me, I will never hate you. Remember, this will end, as in this experience will end. Don't let these people turn you into a monster. Repay evil with what? With good or kindness. And secondly, when Jesus says, uh, give to everyone who begs, the theologian Sam Wells points out. So what we need to do is to remember that even when you can only think of how hurt you've been, there is always someone worse off than you. Always someone worse off than you. And reaching out to them is a way of rescuing yourself from self-pity. That's, that's the invitation. So it's actually an invitation to rescue yourself from self-pity. This week, uh, I was walking, walking back from, from school. Um, uh, at, we live about 700 metres from the primary school that um, Zeb goes to. Zeb's 10. And uh, I met him at the school gate. And we're walking back. And it was, it was bin day. Everyone know bin day? You know, bin's out. Uh, this was yellow bin and red bin day. And the bins were empty. And we're walking back. And, and have you ever noticed that oh, sometimes bin day, the, the bins are across... They, they fall over. The truck just sort of, it's like the truck just goes, meh, and just throws them. And we're walking back on the footpath and there's probably three or four bins in front of us that are across the footpath, the red bins. Obviously an angry truck driver. And I said to Zebby, uh, let's pick the bins up. A, selfishly because they're in our road, but B, because, well, they're our neighbour, right? And do you know what Zebby said to me? He goes, Dad, yeah, I do that every week. I'm like, what a little champion. <laughs> That's a story I'm going to use it on Sunday. <laughs> but let's get practical. Like, how can we love? How can we love in, in the most practical ways? Do you know the cool thing about that? We would have, um, if we didn't stop to pick the bins up, he, was, he goes, I'll do the other side, you do this side, Dad. He's the one leading me. He's 10. So kids know how to love more than we do as adults, I would, I would argue, in many ways. Because they just see things so, so simply and so beautifully, yeah? He's on that side, I'm on this side. We're slowly walking our way along, picking up these bins. And we stop and we have a half an hour conversation with a bloke I've never met, a guy called Barry, who's a Vietnam veteran. Because I slowed down through the practical acts of love. Forgot my agenda because my son invited me to. <laughs> how cool is that? So how can we practic- practically love? What is it? Get out of yourself. You're not that important. I'm not that important. My agenda isn't that important. What about the person next to us? Okay. Here we go. Is this all right? I just need the feedback because I'm insecure. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm, I'm also loved. <laughs> I don't need your feedback. Oh! You suck. I'm going to write a letter. All right. All right. So love is. All right, here it is. So love is. It's revealed in the gospel. It's remaining in Jesus. It's a clear choice to remain in Jesus. It's easy not to. Love is also commanded by God. Jesus wasn't just preachy about love. He did preach about love. He did proclaim it. You've got to remember he was hated. He was cursed and abused. He was beaten and he was shamed and yet he responded with what? With love. 
Because the Beatles were onto something. Because all we need is love from God. As God loves us, as we experience the revelation of God's love, it empowers us to love one another in the most generous of ways. And as Christians, we should be leading in this area of life. So this morning, we get to share in His love through communion. Each week here at City Light, we, we partake in communion in the greatest, remembering the greatest act of love that we could ever experience. I pray today that you would have a revelation of, a fresh revelation of God's love for you. Um, and I also pray that, that God would just drop thoughts into your mind of who you can love more and how you can do that. It's, it's a creative expression of life. Get creative in your love and how you can practically love one another. So we remember Jesus, his broken body represented by the, by the wafer and his blood shed by the juice. As Christians, this is our gift. So if you're here and you're not yet a Christian, I invite you to stay seated as the children of God come and partake in communion. Let us pray. Lord, you're amazing. You are sovereign. You personally care for us and love us so much. I pray that your healing touch would come to your sons and daughters this morning and that the experience of love would be real as a refreshed or maybe for the first time. I pray that we will discover that love wins ultimately, but it also wins in our day to day. I pray for a new revelation as we experience and as we partake in communion with you, God. We thank you that time, you are not bound by time. So therefore, as we take communion this morning, it's as though you were going through that right now. Thank you that you love us. You express it in the greatest love letter ever written in the Word of God from Genesis right through to Revelation. This morning, we partake in communion in Jesus' name.